On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Tara, and Tara grew up in an emotionally, physically, and sexually abusive household. It's a story of generational trauma, sibling abuse, triangulation, and smear campaigns. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Tara. How are you? I'm doing good. Well, thank you for being here. And if you want to be a guest like Tara is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we asked for. And today you're going to hear Tara's story, and there is a content warning on this episode as we do discuss physical violence, physical abuse, and sexual abuse in this episode. So that is our content warning for today. And Tara's story is one of generational trauma, and not just her immediate family, but you'll hear about the extended family as well, growing up as the scapegoat, how that reverberates throughout the whole entire family, even outside of the home, you know, trying to be part of your family in some way, or have these relationships with your family when things are kind of falling apart with your immediate family. And just how hard that can be when everyone has this, you know, smeared view of you and they aren't healthy themselves. They're toxic people themselves. So a big thank you to Tara for being here. And now I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Tara, the floor is now yours. Okay, so what I'm going to cover today is what it was like to grow up in a narcissistic family system. Um, I, there's a lot of different parts to it. It's very hard to cover. Um, so, okay. So very quickly, my, my dad, um, I did, I have like a small bit of information on him. I only knew him until I was about five years old and then he was gone. And it was sort of a big unknown why he was gone. It was like, he's gone. He just, left and so he kind of went deadbeat um but my father what i remember of him was he was very i felt he was very loving he was a very warm person and he had this kind of calming effect on me and he he never i was never hit um and his it was like his job when i was he was with me was to sort of distract me from pain and keep me happy and comfortable and so i had this sort of loving relationship and you know he was just a really blue collar kind of guy he was not um into status symbols he was just he had a lot of very singular interests in nascar racing and driving and car racing he wasn't a very flashy person so i just he would just kind of took people as they come and i I, my mom told me like because it was back in the 70s when i was a kid um you know, he would take her to bars and a lot of the bars were very male oriented and they only would, some bars would only let men in. And he would bring my mom and say, you know, you're my wife, you're coming in. And so he was very, I think he loved my mother, but something happened. I don't know what it was. I probably will never know. My mother was very complicated. There are times I remember her being very empathetic and very warm. And there are times I remember her being very abusive. And so there's this sort of confusing split in her personality where she's good up until a certain point. And then it's like she can't regulate her own self beyond that, a certain breaking point. And I think with her, what happened was when she was in a domestically abusive relationship and she was kind of being not really treated well by family when it was happening by her extended family, she just kind of ended up in a breaking point. And I think 
when she crossed that line into abusing me like that, I think a part of her knew she fucked up and she fucked up big time. And I think it was like she was forever kind of washing the blood off her hands for that mess and trying to push it off on me or go scream to somebody about it, about how I victimized her. And so I think that sort of set in stone her character. I do know she um, was raised, um, so she had um, like a stepmother. Um, so she was product of divorce. I know when my grandfather divorced my grandmother, they were all homeless. So they were all just kind of thrown out of the house. And then I, they all kind of, I think, got pulled back in with my grandmother um, and the stepfather. Um, so I think they had a lot of dysfunction in their earlier life. I think whatever it was that happened to her, it, it kind of messed her up emotionally. And she ended up, I mean, she had my brother when she was young. So my, she had my brother when she was still a teen and she had me when she was like 21. And so she had her kids very young. And I, I think she just, she had just a lot of unresolved issues and I don't I'll never know what they are this episode is brought to you by Sol de Janeiro at Sol de Janeiro touch isn't just for screens physical connection is so essential to how we communicate it's infused in everything we offer sense so irresistible PDA is guaranteed textures are so luscious skin is huggable get into a Sol de Janeiro state of mind Receive 10% off on your first order on soldegenero.com plus free shipping with the code soldegenero10. So, what was your childhood like? It was for the most part for the my very early parts it was fairly normal. Um I did have like my biological father and mother together. Um and I think I had a very loving relationship with my father. But what happened was they got divorced when I was still young and my mother remarried. And when my mother remarried, that's when all the cracks started to show. So from the ages of about five to 10, my mother uh, married this new man. And my first memories of interacting him, with him were really tense. Um, I remember one of the first times when he came into our house, um, I just didn't want to be near him. I felt like his energy was off. And I remember he demanded that I come get a present from him when he walked in the door. And I was too shy, so I just kind of hung back. And so he got mad at me and said, well, fine, I'll give it to your brother. So he gave my gift to my brother. My mom seemed really happy with them. Outwardly, they were kind of like the ideal. So, you know, the house, the two kids, the nice nice house in, in, you know, a nice little town and, you know, everybody's attractive. And so it was like the status of my family seemed good, but on the inside, it was not. Um, he became pretty like physically, kind of physically abusive. Um, I can remember getting hit once with a dustpan and having him really hurt me. And it was treated like nothing had happened. You know, it was just like a normal thing. And so there were moments of physical discipline that just seemed kind of way over the line, but we didn't really talk about it as abuse. We thought we were in trouble or we had done something wrong. And often the things we did wrong were so small, it just didn't make a lot of sense. Um, things from age 10 to 13 really began to devolve. My stepfather became sexually abusive. He started trying to groom me. I can remember things like finding a porn magazine in front of my door and being like, where did this come from? And realizing he probably was, he probably left it there and was spying on me from his room. Um, he started trying to come in my room naked. He would try to kiss me. Um, he would try to touch me inappropriately. And it, it got to a point where one day he came in my room naked and he tried to make me go downstairs with him. And I was really frightened and I ran away and reported him. And my family's response was supportive. Um, so my mother was supportive. 
from what I was told, because um, the police believed me and my stepfather, stepfather admitted guilt. I was told I didn't have to go to court. And so I was told it was kind of an open and shut case. And so um, I did have a lot of support in the beginning, but it was like that support just would fail. Now, it becomes a little bit more disorganized into my early teens, so age 13 to 15. My mother ended up with a boyfriend. She was hooked up to family. And this boyfriend was domestically abusive. Um, so he had beaten her up. Um, and she was very ashamed. She didn't want to press charges. And it was this very kind of push and pull relationship where he would show up absolutely crying and sorry for what he did. And then, you know, he kind of pull her back in and then they would kind of start all over again. And sort of that relationship began devolving and what began happening, the first real kind of red flag that something was wrong was triangulation. So there was a lot of triangulation in this relationship where one party would tell the other, they would talk to somebody to provoke a conversation and then they would go and report to the other person what you said and usually leaving out that they instigated the relationship the the, the conversation um so i can remember him coming to me and saying you should move out you know this is not a good family situation for you i moved out when i was 15 it was fine you'd pro you're probably going to be fine and he went back and told my mom that I wanted to run away, that I told him I wanted to run away. And it, I became involved kind of with some bad people. Like I had some pretty rough, kind of rough friends. And I had a friend who seemed kind of classically narcissistic, very self-absorbed, very much everything's for her, you know, everything kind of revolved around her. And she kind of liked spreading rumors, gossiping. She went and told several guys that I was interested in them when I wasn't. So she liked kind of shaming me and then setting up situations where a guy would come along and make some sort of come on to me and I'd be horrified and she would find that really funny. And so it was like a really not a healthy friendship. And it really actually wore on me. Um, and it got to the point that I began struggling with my mental health. I can remember one day she told me that um, I grow my hair long because all I want is men. And, you know, my 15 year old self saw that as a horrible thing to say, but I ended up kind of taking it out on myself. I, I tried to seek mental health treatment at that point. I went to um, a guidance counselor and I was like 15. And I can just remember my mother her calling my mother and my mother just screaming at, at her. Everything was all her fault. My mother said I deserved foster care. She, she said everything was all my fault. It was like the sky is blue. It's my fault. And I went home and so I was going to go see a talk to the, somebody at the hospital because I felt really terrible and I was actually self-harming. So I went home instead. And when I got home, my mother grabbed me by my hair and got my brother to beat me up. So there's this really horrible episode where she just let him beat me up to control me. And it was a really bad, like I was, I had a black eye. I, I mean, I looked like I had been beaten up and I went to the, I ended up going to the police. I ran out of the house when they went to get the car. They said they were going to force me to a hospital and they said I was crazy. And I, I ran out. And um, these people found me and they brought me to a police station. Um, so it was some neighbors, they saw me running down the street and they're like, are you okay? And so they took me to the police station and the police didn't really do anything. They just kind of sent me to a shelter for a night. And then the next day they came and got me and said, just stop running away. And that was it. I couldn't really talk to anybody. I, I tried to say, I can't really go home. I don't think it's safe for me. Um, and they just said, no, you just need to stop running away and these things won't happen. So we've heard 
a lot of stuff that has happened to you from, you know, birth until now. So one thing we haven't heard is how you're feeling about all these things. I'm feeling distressed, very distressed. Like, I feel like I've lost my mind. Like, I feel like there was a point where my sense of calm and my sense of being able to go about my day in a, a kind of a, a not anxious way has been removed. I feel like like I'm in, a, I'm in like, I'm in distress. And I'm at that point, like when I was sent home, I was just absolutely depressed and my family laughed about it and it got kind of, it got worse. Like it went really downhill. I mean, there was, I struggled with suicidal ideation. I was in absolute hell and it was, uh, there was like, almost like it was I would tell a teacher something like I think I told the teacher what happened and they were just like they looked at me and chuckled like because they did it was like such a weird thing I told her like she just didn't almost believe it, it was like most people come in saying they had an argument with their family I came in and said my mom sat by and watched my brother beat the crap out of me and so it was like I felt like I wasn't heard and I wasn't seen did you have um, friends growing up that you were able to confide in or were you really like a, a lone wolf? I, what was happening at that time is I had moved. So I had moved to this one place and I was in a familiar place. And so when I started feeling really down, there were probably people I could talk to. But what had happened was my mother had just moved. So it was like I we had literally just moved again and it was like a completely new place and I didn't really know anybody and the people I did know were far away. And so it was really, it was hard for me to really talk to people in that very moment of time because I was like, you know, two hours away from where I used to live. So it was like, I, I told teachers, I did talk to friends. I, did start I was making friends and I was telling people what happened but it was it was because it was like my brother I think people saw it as like oh it's just a bit of sibling rivalry brothers and sisters fight I don't she maybe she's making a big deal out of nothing um but it really wasn't you know nothing that was that was the problem um and it was it it kind of escalated so my brother started threatening to kill me every day um he started he would be screaming a torrent of abuse at me and I would turn to my mom and say do you do you hear how your son is talking to me can you help me please and she would say well you're you're probably acting crazy again you deserved it and so there was this I I couldn't get a rational adult or authority to just kind of step in and say, yeah, this is kind of messed up. So my mother really created this situation where she, it was, it was domestic violence. And his, his death threats became kind of frightening because he started collecting knives. I remember one day coming home and he had laid out his knife collection on the living room floor. Like he was doing inventory. He had his girlfriend sitting there and it, I just sort of walked by and was just like, what is this? You know? And, and then one time he brought home a gun and he pointed that gun at me as a, as a joke, as what he said, but he did fire it off and he brought it in and was like, look what I got. Um, and my brother was gone after that point. I didn't see him again. Um, but when he left, my mother kind of took over was being extremely controlling. She wouldn't let me go anywhere. She was constantly trying to punish me for something. I wasn't allowed extracurricular activities. I wasn't allowed to go see friends. But she became very, very controlling. Um, I can remember she, I, I, I had gym class and I needed a bathing suit because um, I had a really old one. And I said, can I get a bathing suit? Like, she was like, no. And I'm like, well, can I borrow yours? I think I have a rip in mine. Like, I just, you know, want to wear a bathing suit that fits in gym class. And it turned into this whole thing where she accused me of stealing her bathing suit and then she had me kicked out of the house. 
And that was it. I was kicked out of the house over a bathing suit. And I ended up living in someone's basement for a period. And then she had me go home. And then she said, well, because, because of your, your behavior, I'm going to ground you until you're 18. You're not allowed to go anywhere. You're not allowed to talk to anybody. Or my mother saying she only did these things to me because she loved me. And I just remember feeling absolute hatred for her in that moment. I was just like, this isn't love. I don't know why this is just, this is cowardice. Like, this is gross. Like, how can you say that? And this really affected my mental health. I, I really, my self-esteem did a nosedive. I can remember being in grade 10, especially when the abuse was really bad and, and trying to fill out a self-esteem quiz we were all given and being afraid to put on paper what I am. Like, I didn't want anybody to know. Like, I just felt confused and I was so depressed. Like, I was just like, I can't do this. Like, it, it just kind of obliterated my sense of self. So this led to things like I, I kind of had boundary issues. I didn't really set boundaries very well with people and I was easily bullied. And I just, it was not a good time. Um, and I can just remember like being bullied in class and it was really just kind of disgusting actually like this kid was like hey you know he said like hey I want to fuck you or like something really like gross and I was just like ew and and me trying to like ignore this kid and the teacher's just sitting there like ah it's fine you know like not really kind of stepping in or helping or anything and it kind of made me feel like I wasn't worth the help So what I did, like what happened was once my mother, my mother kind of went into a phase where she was fine. I didn't understand narcissism at this point. I didn't understand really anything at this point. Um, So my, I just realized my mother was being a little bit better than she normally was. And she was acting a little bit more emotionally balanced. So what I did was I became really absorbed in school and sports. And I just sort of did that. And, and that kind of really brought up my self-esteem. Um, I was no longer depressed and anxious. And it, it kind of helped me grow a little bit. And I started recognizing behaviors that people engage in when they want to control people. And my brother kind of came back in the picture briefly. Um, and he was really dysfunctional. He, you know, had been in jail, uh, in and out of jail. And he just was involved in crime. He did a lot of crime, um, like a lot of theft and stealing. And he just was in and out of trouble. And I remember him coming home and saying to my mom, we have a lot of problems as a family. We need to go see a a therapist as a family. And my mother freaked out. Um, She tried to, she called the hospital she tried to have him forcefully committed and then she said to me that I was ungrateful I think she sort of um gave an example of what my mother was like as a person like just unable to take any kind of criticism or the threat of criticism let's have counseling as a family was a threat to her And I think when I went to a guidance counselor and said I wasn't feeling well, she viewed that as a threat to her. It was, I was threatening her. It didn't matter that I was having a completely different experience unrelated to her. It was about her. And so that was where I started realizing there's something really dysfunctional about my mother. And I, I did really well in school. I was really working hard um I had one more setback where we had a coach who was um an abuser he was you know sexually exploitive he would try to sleep with students he would you know and usually these students would be 15 16 maybe under 18 so younger students he would try to exploit them so it was a really kind of scary time there were some things he said and did that were kind of horrifying. And I remember when I, I was told about him by someone else, I, I confronted him and said, I was told these things about you. And I'm really wondering what is going on? Like what, considering like you've come on to me, you've got on a date and, you know, a lot of really strange things happened 
in this man's presence. And he had me kicked off the track team and he went around telling people I was a, I was a troubled girl and I was making trouble for him and I was getting nosy. Um, and then I guess what happened there is he eventually overstepped his boundaries with someone else. And it was, there was no denying anymore that this guy had to go. And so that was kind of an interesting experience in dealing with another really difficult person who was a predator. I still did really well. I kind of stuck with track and field and school. And I just, it was kind of like, it became kind of my coping mechanism to get away from these horrible people or to kind of have an hour where I'm just physically doing something and doing like a moving meditation. And it became kind of my happy place. So I was, I was, you know, committed to stay, keeping it like that for me because I, I felt I really needed that. There was no crappy, creepy coach who was going to take that from me. And I ended up getting a scholarship. So I, I was going to school um, and I'm getting a sports scholarship and being 1500 miles away from my family. And again, I, I struggled with my mental health. I, I really struggled to, I was pretty shy. I often chose to withdraw as opposed to be, go out and be social or party. You know, that was kind of how I dealt with things. And I think a lot of my, when I moved, it was a very scary thing because I was moving from a home. And yeah, I mean, although it wasn't a perfect home, it was right. So I, I began slowly dealing with my mental health and, and trying to get kind of on terra firma. And I did get through some pretty difficult and dark times. So you end up graduating university and coming back to your hometown and you actually stayed with your brother's girlfriend as your mom didn't want you at her home. So what happens from here? And that's when the, the problems really started. Um, that's when my mother began acting kind of really crazy we think she she is she was an alcoholic um so it's like every day was groundhog day you would have conversations with her where you thought she'd remembered it and she didn't and then if you brought it up again and you said well don't you remember talking about this she'd scream at you and call you a liar so this fed into her notion that you were mistreating her and it was just, it was just a headache to deal with. And every day, you know, she, she just would yell things like she was a very all or nothing person. So again, I think she was fairly narcissistic. So it was like, either you're pleasing her, or you won't. And when you weren't, she was just like, that's not good enough. You know, that was her favorite line. That's what I remember from her during that time is her screaming, that's not good enough. And it was like I had many conversations and it was like, it was almost like she didn't want you to meet her expectations. So she, what she would do was I would have this conversation. It wouldn't go well. And she would go and tell all of family how I treated her and how I mistreated her and victimized her. And it was just sort of this downward spiral into her making accusations and smears. And then she started also triangulating my brother into the situation. So you're back from school, you're dealing with your mom, and the only place that you have to stay is with your brother's girlfriend. And that means you are seeing your brother more often than what is ideal, but his girlfriend is being nice and giving you this place to stay while you're trying to figure things out post-university. So what is your every day like at this point? It was just, it was just hell between them. Like, and I, I was, I mean, I was like a little, by that point, I think I was so used to it. I, I developed this sort of skill and I didn't realize it at the time, but I was like a professional gray rocker. I just, and I, I mean, it probably developed since I was in high school. If somebody was 
screaming stuff in my face or triangulating or trying to bully, I just would shut down. I didn't feel like, oh, okay, you want to accuse me of something I didn't do. Fine. You do that. Okay. And I would go very quiet and calm. And that's kind of how I dealt with them. I just, I was just like, you know, my mother's screaming at me, telling me what a horrible child I am on the phone. And she's just shouting abuse at me. And I'm just like, are you done now? Do you want to actually talk about what, what it is that's bothering you? Like, what is going on here? I don't, you screamed a bunch of stuff at me, but it doesn't, none of it makes any sense. And then she just would rage. And I almost found it kind of pathetic, to be honest. Like I didn't, I felt like I had power. I felt like I, I really did have the power in this situation, even when I didn't feel like I had it and I was being abused. Every conversation was, you're a failure, you're disgusting, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, I'm working two jobs, mom. You know, like the conversation I would have would be, it was like she was talking to someone else. Like she wasn't even hearing me. So I have a question about that. Yeah. So she's treating you in a way that is not fair at all. And as you just said there, it's like she's talking about someone or talking to someone else that's not you. Yeah. So that's your relationship with her. And then you have your brother who is, you know, a huge problem. And the law knows that he's a huge problem and he has troubles with the law. And he is a real thing. So when it comes to your mom and her relationship with him, where, uh, you know, who knows what's happened along the way with her relationship with him that has caused him to be the way he is. Do they have a different kind of relationship where, um, like, do they get along in any sort of way? Like, what's going on with them? Because every child has a different relationship with their parents. It's really, a, it's a puzzle. Like, it's almost like they're kind of the same. So they kind of feed into each other's sort of psychopathy, I call it. And that's like the only way I can look at it because it is, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's inhuman sometimes the way they interact. My mother will say something to him and he gets a rise out of it. So he does, he reacts because she said this. So he hits me. He gets a rise out of that. My mother says, well, it's her fault. So it sounds like you are part of this trickle down cycle where your brother gets emotionally abused by your mom. He then takes it out on you. His abuse is then justified by your mom. And then you get like this gaslighting of you in that moment, thus giving you this real big double dose of abuse. And this just really sounds very crazy making. And you can understand how someone might lose their mind in a situation like this when you're getting this double dose from in both sides and reality is being warped in, in, in a very big way. And it was, uh, you know, he, and he would scream at me too. Like, I remember I got an apartment and I was set to move in on the first, like you normally do with a lot of apartments. He starts screaming at me, calling me a fucking asshole. He's just unleashing a torrent of abuse on me. And my mother's on the phone too. And I said, do you listen to how your son's talking to me? And she goes, he's doing that because he's protecting me from you. And I'm like, from yourself? Is that what, she, what he's protecting you from? <laughs> like, it was just like so insane that like, I was just like, yeah, these people are fucking crazy. This has nothing to do with me. Like, and that's, I think how I got out of it. Like, it's not about me. It really isn't. I mean, there is a level of pain and hurt from having had a mother who wasn't a mother. Um, there's kind of a, a sense of realizing, like, you know, going back and going, well, was she was she being empathetic there, or was it just because she had all her all the eyes on her and she had to be empathetic? Like, so there's it, it's like I, I had a realization, and at that point I was mentally balanced and I was strong I, I I had done something with myself that made me stronger balanced and I decided that whatever it is they do or say it can't touch it doesn't touch who I am I'm not them and that's why they don't like me 
And it's not because I'm doing something wrong. It's because I'm doing something right. And I just, that's kind of how I rolled with it. I mean, she completely smeared me to family. I, my brother, at one, you know, I was set to move and my brother showed up and stole all my possessions. And it, it just turned into this snowball where she just would, go to family and say I'm abusing her and then, you know, come and scream at me on the phone and abuse me for a couple minutes and then hang up on me um, or get my brother to go and put me in a worse situation so they can have something more to harp about. Um, I just saw them as ugly people. They're just messed up people. Hi, everyone. I know many of you are always looking for new podcasts to binge, and I binge the podcast Nobody Should Believe Me, and I loved it. It is a groundbreaking investigative true crime podcast about Munchausen by Proxy, hosted by author Andrea Dunlop, who has been a guest on our show before. And all of the eight episodes of season one are out now, and they are ready to binge. And it is consistently on the Apple True Crime charts And guess what? Season two is airing now, and I am very excited about it. And it is covering a shocking new Munchausen by proxy case, talking to survivors and going deeper into Andrea's story, too. So if you need a new podcast, I'll be listening to Nobody Should Believe Me, and I think you'll enjoy it, too. Nobody Should Believe Me is available on all podcast apps. So you've brought up your extended family yeah so i guess you know she's going and smearing you so what is their role the extended family the enablers and 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 do you have any sort of relationship with any members of that side of the family at all i had um a relationship with my aunt um There was a point when I was 16 and my aunt and uncle had me um, at their cottage and they they were like, what's going on at home? So they started because they were they could see something was wrong. And they so they wanted to figure out what was happening at home. And I told them the story about when my mom let my brother beat me and they were just kind of horrified and they were shocked. And so they they knew they knew what was going on. But. It was like, it was such, I think my mother's behavior was almost like kind of background noise where they knew she was a dysfunctional, they knew what she was like, and they just kind of like, here, I don't want to deal with her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's complaining about the kid. Yeah, whatever. Oh, the kid probably did something wrong. So it was kind of like they were enabling, like they didn't want to deal with it. They couldn't, I guess, fathom that my mother was the problem. So eventually things became too much with everyone and you go low to no contact with your family. So walk us through how uh, bigger contact uh, happened again. Nobody really reached out to me. Um, And I can remember when I was 28, my grandfather died. And then so family reached out to me and being on the phone with my mom and, and trying to have a a conversation with her and being like, I just want to talk to you. Like, how are you doing? She's like, fine. And she just goes, and then hangs up on me. Like just this big huff, like I'm overwhelming her with asking her how she's doing. But like, that's how she was. I, I kind of had an on again, off again, like very low contact relationship with my family, my brother, you know, managed to get back in trouble a lot um particularly with domestic violence i can remember getting a phone call collect call from prison from him where he wanted me to bail him out and i said no and he you know i think he did it again he went into and it was again he did this colossal screw up of his life where he was slated to be married to a girl or a woman i should say um he was slated to be married to this woman and he had an affair behind her back he ended up assaulting his mistress a week before he was set to be married and trying to drive away from the scene drunk. And so he got a DUI and a domestic a violence charge. So it was kind of me just sort of casually kind of witnessing all this and going, oh my, 
And I think by my, like, I was doing really well up until I was 28. I think my mental health in my 30s was suffering. It was like, I started therapy and it was like the lid was suddenly pulled off of all those things that had happened and it kind of came out and I was struggling. Well, well, I was going to ask you, yeah. um, you know, you're, you're at, I was going to say like you're 28 ish, 30 ish years old, probably around now. And your whole life has been responding to others and bouncing off other people you're trying to get away from it but yeah yeah but eventually somehow it's always coming back to these other people and your life isn't your life in a lot of ways it isn't so like how are you you know functioning or you're gonna, like eventually you're going to come to that realization where you're like my life isn't my life like it's going to pop into your head and that oh my god like I'm unable to form relationships in lots of ways. Like things have taken its toll beyond, you know, I have no frame of reference for what life is and where someone should be mentally at this point. Yeah. So I I guess, you know, a lot of people are having a quarter life crisis of like, what do I do with the rest of my life? You know, your quarter life crisis in a big way is, what is, do I have a life? What is my life? Like, who am I? Yeah. And that's really what was happening. Like, it was like all those things, you know, that I either cope with maladaptively or or very well. Like some of my coping mechanisms, like gray rocking, like that was almost, I almost did that too well. Like, so it was like, I would have an, a partner who was literally a replica of like my brother and they were abusive towards me and it was like I literally kind of took it until one day they said something to me and I just I didn't even say anything I just said stop and like hung up on them lost their phone number changed my phone number and so well I'm moving soon anyways I just I just don't give them my address and that was it I was done I kind of woke up at that point and I I just realized like yeah, like I don't have a frame of a good frame of reference for what a healthy relationship is. And so I was always kind of like the professional placator in, in, in the relationship where it's like, you know, your boyfriend's screaming about something and you're just trying to like, you're calmly just sort of standing there taking in all their crap. And they, they don't seem to think like, I'm not an emotional punching bag. Like you have to stop. Um, and I, it got really hard. Like I was in it, I did get into a relationship and I mean, it was, there was a lot of, like, they weren't a narcissist, but they were, they did a lot of things. Like I, I, it, like they trying, you know, they manipulated, they gaslit, they would say things and they'd be like, no, I didn't say that. So it was a constant, like being unsure of where I stood in that person's life. So it was always kind of, you know, confusing for me and I didn't know how to really ask for better um I'm I was having a really hard time in my mid-30s and my mother said come home I'm I'm worried about you I'm actually worried about you um and she she saw me once and she said I you know I think you're having a really hard time and she said I I can tell and I I think my mother as crazy and as difficult as she was I think she had some semblance of decency in there. I think there, there are some family secrets in my family that I, I probably will never know until, you know, I'll never know. Like, I'll never know what caused her to be that way. It could have been nothing. It could have been a lot of things. Um, but when I went to live with her, she was, you know, still pretty dysfunctional. She was an alcoholic. Um, I used to go into her room and I would find, you know, measuring cups with alcohol hidden in, hidden in the cupboard because she didn't want to let me know that she was drinking because she went off drinking really hard one day. And I said, you know, you need to stop that. You're, you're taking medication. You're taking pain medication. You don't want to mix the booze with the pain medication. You could kill yourself. 
And she was just like, I'm safe. And I'm like, honey, you drank four liters of wine over the weekend. That's not safe. <laughs> um, you know, so I had to kind of talk to her and she, you know, so she was hiding booze in her cupboard. Um, and her kind of her manipulative tendencies eventually got the best of her. And I, instead of sitting around trying to work it out with her, I went no contact. I cut it off a lot sooner than I normally did. And that was really hard for me. I, I felt like guilt. I felt like the bad daughter. I felt sad. I was kind of depressed. And so I was no contact with her um, since like 2012. So eventually your aunt becomes part of your life after this. You have more contact, kind of like the enemy of my enemy is a friend kind of thing in a way. And you don't know that she is toxic yet. And she buddies up to you. So how does she go about doing this? So my mom, my aunt started kind of telling me little details. Like she brought up the earlier part of my life. So she brought up the the case, the sexual abuse case, where she she said, you know, your mother didn't care. She didn't actually try. She didn't want to be interviewed by the police. She actually evaded being interviewed by the police. And then she, so she was telling me kind of really damning information about it. And she told me like her, she never told her partner about it. And so she was really giving, trying to paint my mom in a really negative light. And I have no idea what is true or what is something my, my aunt maybe came to that conclusion because of how my mother reacted. So this aunt seems to be someone who is listening to you. But eventually she really starts to show her true colors and becomes toxic. And some raging phone calls happened. And then one day you are just conversing with her and you tell her the story about your superintendent and his inappropriateness and specifically a story about him and getting an exterminator. And out of nowhere, uh, even though she doesn't even know this person, she just calls you a liar, rages, and things explode. So what happened from here? My aunt, in the meanwhile, made me apologize for the situation. So she had me, I had to call her. They stopped talking to me. They cut me out. And I said, I'm really sorry. And she, well, did you work things out? I said, well, yeah, I think so. I hope so. Because, you know, as long as he's not drunk, I think we'll be fine. Um, and I think what happened was one more time, he, was, he had to do a repair in my place. And I was, I was there. And he was, as he was in my place, he was bragging about beating up a tenant. Um, and he said he went, he put tape over the security cameras. And he went in a female tenant's unit and stole her medication. And I'm sitting there going, like, why are you telling me this? And and I at the time I put security cameras in my apartment because I wasn't feeling safe. So I just went and I mean, here's where I'm being manipulative. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go out for a while. I just I'm gonna go to the store. Do you want anything? Do you want any beer? Do you want me to grab you something? And he's like, sure. I'm like, what beer do you drink? And he tells me the beer, and I I go go and come back in like 20 minutes. And he's like, just delighted when I come back. He's like, how did you know what beer to buy me? And I'm like, you just told me 20 minutes ago what beer you wanted me to buy you. So I didn't tell my aunt at all about this story because I felt like it would be used against me. And I ended up telling the owner. And I don't know what came of it. I just know my superintendent is no longer in the building. And so we have a new person will be running the building and hopefully much better <laughs> but my aunt was very interesting so after I apologized to her she said she almost gave my address to my mother knowing like I'd been no contact for like 10 years and when she said that I started I kind of chuckled and I thought oh my god I would disown you why would you do that and and she just responded with rage and it was like, I could see she was really angry. And I'm like, but why, why would you give out my personal information without asking me? Like, why would you do that? Like, what are you, what's your end game here? 
like you've just said my mother's a terrible person and now you want to give my address to her so what are you what are you suggesting here um and it was like she was scorekeeping kind of like she was she took my reaction and then sort of saved that in her memory bank of a transgression I did towards her. So I had deeply offended her in that conversation. So your mom ends up passing away. And even though you hadn't talked to your mom in a very long time, it is still your mom. And there is still a grieving process, no matter what your relationship is with your mom and anyone in these situations. And you want to go to her funeral, and that's when games start to happen to have you not come. Your brother starts to stonewall you, and your aunt tries to dissuade you from going. So tell us a little about this. You know, she was like, you had said once you were very angry at your mother. I'm like, yeah, that's normal. That's a normal, healthy emotion to have you know, I have a right to have other feelings besides anger too. And then, so she was, it was really strange. Like, and she said, well, your brother said this about you. And so it was like, she was playing like this triangle game with my brother and me. It was like, literally, I said, it's like, you've accidentally recreated the family dynamic we had with our mother, where he's coming to you behind my back. You're, you're controlling the situation a certain way. And I said, it's not okay. I was, I, the email I sent her, I, I didn't even, I didn't even tell it as, you know, I was so polite in it. I was so like gentle as I could be in my words. And she was like, don't start your drama with me. And I'm just like, well, wait a minute. I'm not the one creating this situation. Like, don't start your drama with me. Like, and I didn't respond to her that way. Like, I let it go. I was like, okay, you're upset. Like, just let it go. So here's this time where your mom has passed away and your aunt has, you know, recreated your life with your mom and your brother. You know, during that time you had gone to therapy, you know, and you're and you're trying to live your life and you know, kind of separate yourself in a lot of ways and create the you that you want to be. Yeah. And now you're being kind of, in this moment, sucked back into justifying, you know, going through these cycles, like getting into these arguments. Are you recognizing that while it's going on? Like, are are are, are you... You know, when you're responding, obviously you're an adult and you're responding as an adult, but you're also kind of being thrown back into this world where you're a child or treated like a child. Yeah. And so our old habits or old ways of being popping back up, like, are you getting those feelings of anxiety are you getting that old idea of like oh you know when i was depressed and things like that like when that happens like a little bit yeah because it, it'd be hard to like you you get thrown back into it not realizing you're about to be thrown back into it and when that kind of happens things can kind of really cave in because you're not prepared for it i think I was kind of prepared for it by that point. I, I felt like I had sort of done my own inner journey in a way that I had created this emotional space within myself, even though, I mean, I'm a person who struggles with anxiety and, you know, I can't, I feel like I can't deal with like the most mundane situations sometimes. Um, I had given myself this emotional space where I'm like, observing and i'm choosing my responses i'm not being insulting i'm i choose to see what it is why she's doing this i want to see her reaction it just made me feel really dismissed like she was dismissing me she was dismissing the feelings i've i've grown up with and she was dismissing 
potentially my abuse experience. And I just said to her, you know, I'm not even really angry at this point. I'm just really tired and scared of what I'm witnessing. And I don't like it. And I said, sure, you know, I, I, I need help. But I said, this family could use a bit of help too. You know, like it's not, I'm not the only person here. You know, I, I just said, I'm done. Please stop contacting me. And that was it. <laughs> so what happens from here? I am going into my life. I am, I think at first I felt tremendous guilt. I wanted to fix everything. I felt like, what am I saying wrong? There must be something I've said that's upsetting. Like I was constantly trying to fix the situation and I felt like I had done wrong. And yet I felt like no matter how well I tried to state my feelings or my case, it was just going to be absolutely shit on and viewed as this total social affront by my aunt. And I just, my, I talked to my therapist and they're like, you know, people in toxic relationships who come out and say, I don't know what I did wrong. Um, and they're suddenly trying to be responsible usually aren't the problem in the relationship. Because you're the one trying to actually talk and communicate. It, it's not you. I think you were abused. And, and so I've been kind of working on that part where I give myself a bit of confidence at least. And it's been helping me. And so I've been low contact and no contact a lot of points in my life. So I figure it's not something so unusual that I can't handle it. I think I'm kind of getting into a new phase of understanding and I'm still a very anxious person. I, I, I gotta admit, I'm still kind of depressed. <laughs> I will probably forever be. It's not, you know, at that part, I'm going to need a little bit of help with, and it's going to take me some time, but I think we're kind of in a new sort of understanding in life. And in general, in the world, if you look around, I mean, a lot of the stuff that helps me with this situation, I found online at my fingertips. I got through a, a free counseling. I got, you know, there's sort of this open understanding now that having a mental illness is, you know, it's an illness like diabetes. You can treat that. It's there's less shame, I think, around discussing your mental health. There's more understanding of conflict in relationships. So there's a real push, I think, to try and understand it. And so I'm I'm kind of just working through. I'm I'm listening to a lot of podcasts now. I think last night I listened to a podcast about neurodivergence and personality disorders and how they intersect and how personality disorders can be like almost like a developmental disorder where the child does not get appropriate love and care at a certain point in their life. So they sort of build this character up and that's how they function in the world because that's how they survived as a child. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot more compassion in the world when it comes to understanding mental health. So I'm kind of slowly embracing it and just using therapy i'm going to group therapy too and it's it's kind of i've decided that my story is not something i should be afraid of saying of telling i was very afraid of talking about it because i felt like my family's going to come after me <laughs> like like so they're going to show up at my doorstep and it's just going to be like all of, you know all over again um and i i've decided that it doesn't matter if, if I sit here and be quiet, you know, my life stays the same. If I decide to talk about it, my life has a chance to improve. And I have one of the things I recognized when it came to disclosure of my abuse is the fact that my disclosure would help someone else. So when I disclosed my sexual abuse um, in my childhood, that helped my friend disclose her sexual abuse and her abuse at home. It helps you make a safer world for others, make a more understanding world. So I think that's where I'm at right now. 
I'm kind of learning a lot of things. And if you had any words of wisdom for everyone listening, what would they be? You are who you are. If you're in an abuse situation, it it will feel like your soul is being torn in half and your soul is being eviscerated from your body. And I think at the darkest points in my life, that's what it felt like. And you will get that back. You will come to a place of understanding and of wisdom there's this sense of myself that's just unshakable it you know you could put me in a firestorm of shitty things and my sense of self is I still am who I am and you still are who you are it may affect you in certain ways you may have a lot of trouble coping with that you'll you'll come to an understanding and a gentler understanding eventually of yourself Like, don't be frustrated with yourself. Understand that you are in a really painful place. And sometimes with abuse, especially when you can't, you've you've done all you can to try to reach out to others and you're not getting out. You will eventually get to a place where you can be gentle with yourself. And there's a world of people out there who have had the same experiences and, you know, you have, you always have so much more to give, you know, you always like, you're always of value to someone and, and just don't forget that. Well, Tara, (laughs) I really want to thank you for being a guest here with us. And, you know, family stories are not easy to tell and constructing you know, going through this process with me and constructing your story when it's a family story, not easy to do. And it's hard to pick stories of your whole entire life to tell and to emphasize so people can understand, but also have validation for the experience that they're going through, whether it be relationship, whether it be with uh, one of your parents and with you, we don't really talk about Uh, sibling abuse a lot on the show and it's a thing so I really want to thank you for uh, being here uh, with us today and sharing everything and um, you know really just laying things out very clear for everyone and you know you you were a teacher today and I just really want to thank you so much for uh, being here with us thank you so much for having me Well, thank you once again, Tara, for being our guest. And if you want to be a guest like Tara was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. Also at our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com, we have a support group. So if you need support, top of the page, there's a button that says support group. Click on that button. It takes you to our very own safe social network. There you can see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday nights, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We also have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need and to validate other survivors just like you on their posts. So if you need support, join our group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at domesticshelters.org. At domesticshelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you are dealing with. They have every phone number, email address, and web address for shelters and agencies, no matter how big or small the town you are in. Domesticshelters.org has it there. It is a wonderful free resource, a wonderful organization. That is domesticshelters.org. And that is it for today's episode. So for myself and Tara, we hope you have a good night.